Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Mark Malott, a senior director with the Cerner Corporation. Prior to joining Cerner in 2017, Mark served in the Army first as a combat medic and later as a Medical Service Corps officer specializing in health information systems management. He describes the field of health information systems management as the confluence of people, problems, and technology, and it was helping people solve problems through the appropriate and efficient use of technology that drew him into the field. In particular, some 15 years ago, Mark began began thinking about the problem of electronic health records in combat zones and how to ensure that information about injured soldiers was being captured and preserved. Mark had observed this problem during his multiple deployments to Kosovo and Iraq. This passion led him to earn a PhD in policy and to deploy to Afghanistan to test his theories. After retiring from the Army, he went on to the Cerner Corporation, where he is part of the team working to deploy an integrated electronic medical record to both the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration. I enjoyed doing this interview with Mark because he has been one of my closest friends for more than 10 years. So my interviewing style is a little less formal and we laugh a bit more than usual. Despite that, I hope you enjoy my interview with Mark. And if you do, won't you take a moment to leave us a rating on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be listening to this recording. It helps other people find us. Thanks for listening. And here is my very good friend, Lieutenant Colonel Retired, Mark Malott. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Hey, so glad to be here. Thank you so much, Mark. Now, you were like one of the first people I wanted to have on this podcast, and you've been blowing me off for like four years. So Whatever, I'm you came glad. to your senses, and you're like, yeah, I should <laughs> never record this guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, all right, so, so let's start with, at the beginning. You were a triple major uh, in your kind of first run at college, right? As a, was it philosophy? literature, and I don't know what the other one was. It was, it was theater, right? And theater. So I, had, I, had, I was getting ready to, to announce that, and I had talked to my father, and he's like, that's great. So you'll be able to <laughs> sit with that triple degree and think about the essence of French friedness, is what he used to say, <laughs> as a, you know, as a down yeah. and dirty attorney, former infantry guy, he was like, that's what you're going to do is figure out the essence of French friedness and what that really means to humanity. Thank you so much, son. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. it. Which is funny because, uh, you know, you and I wound up many years later working together um, and my, my uh, uh, majors were philosophy and English as well. You were, you had me beat by one. I didn't have drama added on there, but you know. Yeah. But I, so when I, by the time I finished though, I mean, to, cause you are a really smart guy. I mean, I ended uh, up with just a, a degree in English literature and I minored in classics. So I was kind right, of a, right. you know, yeah, kind well, of a we, Okay. So, so you were there, you were, you were, you were doing the great liberal arts thing, which is awesome. Um, I think we both agree it is actually awesome. Uh, and, it is. Uh, it is. At some point, you actually decided to leave school and join the military. So tell me about that. So what was happening? What was going on in your, in your, you know, in your life? Because you, so, like I said, this was kind of the first run at, at college for you. So what happened? <laughs> That's right. I serve oftentimes, and, and I like to say that sometimes I serve as, a, as an example of, you know, how to, how to do things. And sometimes I definitely serve as an example of this is what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so it was the, right at the beginning of the first Gulf War. So I had long hair. I was protesting. I had hair, you know, down to my chin in the front and, and to my shoulder, about to my shoulder blades in the back. Nice. Uh, long hip. Oh, yeah. This is the was it a mullet or was it like long all around? Okay, let's, let's not get <laughs> This is the beginning of the grunge movement. Um, I'm going to say it was long all around. Right? All right, then. A little less on the mullet side. But... Yeah. You get, thank, thanks for bringing that up. That's awesome. Okay. Um, which we'll get to later because I spent a year in Afghanistan because someone mispronounced my name uh, the first time I was introduced to my unit actually, after we left at Baylor. Uh, and I left at Baylor to go deploy again. And I was called mullet for a year. So since then, I've been kind of <laughs> sensitive to the mullet thing. Uh, because otherwise, it is, come on, business in the front, party in the back. It's always a good play. So... <laughs> So with that, yes, it was the, it was the first Gulf War. It kicked off um, 
I, I had, you know, I had spent some time really thinking about what, what is my role supposed to be here? What am I, I'm a college student. I come from a long line of military, you know, my, both my grandfathers, my father, my brother, all my uncles, it's kind of like, it's the family profession was to go into the military and, and to be in the infantry. And, and here I am in some small liberal arts school in Minnesota and, and I'm protesting. And, and it hit me as this is, we're going through this process because I wasn't protesting ever. Um, the service members, just what we were doing at the time. And I realized as I'm sitting there in class one day and I'm kind of just watching this as this is quickly kind of progressing. I was like, you know what? If I'm gonna complain, because that's part of being an American is to be able to complain and be able to say, you know what? It's, it, it's okay, but what are your actions? What are you going to do? I mean, Mark Mullins, you got long hair, but you still are, you are a man of action. So what are you gonna do? And I said, I needed to ante up and kick in. And to me, in my 20-year-old head, that meant enlist. And so I did. I went home, went back to, back to Kansas City, uh, finished up my second year of school. And after my second year of school, I officially dropped out and enlisted in the Army. And I said, you know, this is based on you know, your background, my background, and we've talked about this so many times. Uh, I said, that's not who I am as an, as an infantry person. However, I want to be with those people. I want to support them um, and I want to help my fellow man. So how do I do that? I'll go be a medic. And it, at the time, <laughs> it made perfect sense, of course. Sure. Yeah, and so I did, I dropped out and I enlisted uh, in the army. So that's, that's what I did, did a couple years, two and a half, almost three years. And then I said, you know what, army's great. It's just, it's not for me. This isn't, this isn't how I see myself. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, hop out, maybe finish up my time in the reserves and, and go from there. And then, of course, came back. You, you were in for what, like a three-year hitch? Yep. Did the initial kind of a small three-year hitch. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've done your time and you went ahead and, and, and left active duty. Still had some reserve time left. Right, right. So I had, had some reserve time and, and got into it. And as soon as I started in the reserves, they said, hey, wouldn't you like to go be a flight medic? Oh, my gosh. So anybody that was a line medic and you're out there with all your, your folks, there'd always be a person who would come in on the helicopter and go, I've got this from here. And they'd jump <laughs> off the aircraft, take over your, your people, and then move out. I'm like, that's pretty cool. So I did that for a couple of years, went through, though. It was called the, the, the progression sequence to become a flight medic, became a flight medic. Um, while I was finishing up my degree at the University of Georgia, did that for a couple of years. And then while I was still finishing up there, I had the opportunity to get a, uh, an ROTC scholarship. So about a year and a half was flight medic. And then from there it was into ROTC land to go and say, you know what, let's, let's try it. I think I'm enjoying it. I was enjoying the reserves. I said, let's go ahead. And as I was going through ROTC, I uh, went ahead and, and said, let's go ahead and apply for active duty. Okay. So now this is, you know, for people who are civilian, this is not like that might not be immediately obvious. Like, of course you would go on active duty, but that's not actually, everybody doesn't do that. And, and this is like the early nineties, right? This is what, 95 maybe. So I, I went back to school starting, um, gosh, the fall of 94. Yep. And okay. then I, I graduated and commissioned in 97. Okay. So, so October of 97. Yeah, but the Army is like going through this downsizing at that point. That's kind of what I'm, uh, the point I want to make is like fo folks may not remember that. We had the peace, di well, we had the peace dividend. That, yeah, we had the peace dividend. Supposedly we're going to downsize the Army to like 300,000 people. And, but uh, so you applied to go on active duty. And, and when it comes time to commission, you have to ask for a, uh, a, a career field in the military. So what did you ask for? So, <laughs> so you as, an, as an English major, as an English major, because I said, I'm going to go back and do my degree in something I love. I'm going to do my undergraduate in something I love, and I'm going to do graduate work in something that's going to make me money. That was mm -hmm. my big, that was how I rationalized at the time. Let's okay. talk to ourselves. So yep. I did, I ended up with a, a, a literature degree. I did okay in my undergrad finishing up. I just um, had an, so I really wanted to be able to do other things, right? To be able to commission, to go have, have fun and do other things. I, I actually put infantry number one and really? yes, I did. But because of downsizing and what was happening at the time, I actually became a medical service corps. They're like, you were a doc. You're going to go be a doc. 
I was like, that's great. So I'm going to go be a, a medical service corps officer. And that okay. was, so that was, I think, second choice, which was fine. So, so did that, came with medical, and I branched medical service corps. They were able to send me through jump school and had a great time going through airborne training while I was still a cadet. Uh, and yeah, so did that commission and then went on to first assignment. Early career, let's kind of talk about a little bit about that. Like, uh, what does it mean to be a medical, what is a medical service corps officer? Sure. Well, yeah. I should ask you the same thing. Right. Gee, Mark, we were both. What is it to be? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so, and there's different flavors. So I, first year or so, I started in operations. I actually didn't go to a, a normal line unit right away. I went to a hospital. And you were absolutely correct. I went to a garrison facility. So it was the fixed facility, kind of normal hospital uh, called McDonald Army Community Hospital in Fort Eustis, Virginia. Uh, great location. Yeah, yeah. Let me just interrupt because folks may not realize, well, okay, you're a medical person. Of course you go to a hospital. Mm-hmm. Why is that kind of unusual? So most of the time when you're a lieutenant, you'll go to a field unit. You will go and be a platoon leader somewhere. You will have a group of ambulances. You'll have some, you'll be helping some doctors kind of actually learn how to plan and do things like that. Uh, and that's the normal course of action. And you'll be supporting like the military or a tank. Unit, Absolutely. Not yep. planning in a hospital, right? This is yep. not happening. You'd be in supporting an infantry unit. You'd be doing something else. Mm-hmm. Um, but to your point earlier, this was a time of a lot of downsizing. And I was there as a lieutenant. A fixed facility hospital, a normal brick and mortar facility is not the place you want to go if you want to progress. Right mm-hmm. in the military, you need to spend some time, and we call spend some time in the field, right? Doing kind of dirty boot things, jumping out of planes, working with tank units, infantry units, that sort of thing. So, I was at that that unit for about goodness gracious uh, two years because I knew that I needed to move pretty quickly. So it forced me though, because in this time this time of kind of a lot of drawdowns, uh, to start looking for immediately start working for, looking for hard jobs. So I started looking for hard jobs. I went to operations for the first year for this small hospital, which is kind of the, the physical security, that sort of thing, right? The physical security of the facilities, emergency planning, um, continue continuity of operations planning, working with local EMS. And that was fun for the first year. Uh, and then I started working immediately on my master's degree because there had to be something I knew I wanted at this point to stay in. I was enjoying it. Uh, I had a young family at the time, and I said, you know what, I need to do everything I can. And so I immediately started working on a master's in public administration mm. uh, and, and really was enjoying, that, was enjoying that coursework. And they actually brought me to, and they asked me, we, we have a problem, a managerial problem in our information technology, in our IT department. Mm-hmm. Um, we, have, we have some some problems with some of our civilian workforce, some of the normal people that are not in uniform, kind of some of the work that's going on there, can you help us out? And I was like, it's a management problem. I know hardly anything about computers, but I know how to read a help file and people are people. So I just jumped right in, jumped right in, started learning, went, started going through classes to learn on my own time, um, became very uh, kind of just just ravenous in, in how much I had to learn. Right about IT, being a better leader. Not, ah, how to be a leader. How to do uh, man. How to do manage. How to be a better manager. Right. How to manage information systems. How to think kind of a couple chess moves ahead, but also how to code in H. Because at that point, you're, <laughs> the hottest new thing was to code in HTML. Mm. So I taught myself how to code in HTML. I taught myself how to build web designs um, for my for my unit. Right for my facility, I wanted to solve whatever the biggest problems were. And so it just so happened that the problems were IT problems. And because they were IT problems, like, oh my gosh, this is great. And that's where it started. It's, I started finding a way forward because IT problems, and I would argue still to this day, are a couple things. It is, it is solving some of the most pressing problems for individuals in being able to communicate together not between bits and bytes, but for people to be able to relay a thought, a meaning, uh, information, to be able to move beyond transaction, right? Mm-hmm. So I saw this earlier, I'm like, this is awesome. And so, at, but at the same time, it's about people. I mean, this, this is nothing better. And oh, by the way, there's no one that is more grateful 
than someone who has been working and they lose a file that they've had for months <laughs> or weeks or a paper that you've lost, because I know you have as well, my friend. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And somehow you can find it for them. You can bring it back. I mean, all of a sudden, oh, my gosh, you're amazing. It's like the, the sky is open and the, yeah, the, the cherubs come down and they play great music because you found their file. Because you walked away and you read the help file and you didn't give up. Yeah. So you, so you've kind of had this early, this is right at the beginning of your, uh, well, I guess your second run at active duty, right? So you're it's right at the beginning of your, of your officer career. Um, so you start encountering, you have this first exposure. At what point did you ask the army to reclassify you as a, as a medical service information um, Service. Right. So, so as a 70 Delta is what. Yeah, what they were called a 70 Delta. There's, there's right at a hundred of us in the entire arm in the entire army, right? The other branches, the army and Navy have some, but they're usually kind of cross discipline. They do a couple of things uh, in the army. You're really focused on health IT. And so I was working through my master's as fast as I could. I was doing a full load as, as a normal graduate student, full load, um, three or four courses at a time and working full time uh, and family and everything else. Um, we had the, the medical information systems community in the army was just standing up. They'd had some people doing it before, but they had just started uh, their first formal class in how to become one of these 70 deltas the year before. And so this is what a great time. So we have all these things coming together, converging at once. We have this, this new idea of a group of people that they're going to formalize and codify called mm -hmm. 70 Deltas. Uh, most of them that were coming into this field, oh, by the way, they were true IT people. They were computer people. They were people that loved building computers in their basement. Could not stand that. I wanted to solve problems. So it was a new thing. I found a niche within that community. Y2K was ramping up. So if you're somebody who could speak to other people, calm them down, understand kind of expectation management. And then I started finding this, this small group, and we'll talk about that more later, but this small group of people that then did it in a deployed environment, right? So in kind of a combat environment, which is even a smaller niche. And so that's, that's actually where I went kind of transitioning on. That's that's where I went next was directly to a field unit. Yeah. Okay. So you've been working. This initial kind of tour was it was in a hospital, like, and it's an army hospital, but it looks like any other hospital except that there's lots of army guys running around, right? So, <laughs> yes. um, uh, uh, but then and then you but then you finally you do finally transition to a real a, a field unit where you're now you're with what what kind of unit were you with? Um, so I was with a medical brigade. So let me ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Mark, what kind of unit did you go to first and, and where was that located? So I actually had the same experience as you. I wound up as a brand new second lieutenant at a at an army hospital at uh, William Beaumont at Fort Bliss down in El Paso. And I did that for about a year and a half. Then I, like you, uh, transitioned to um, the third the third armored cavalry regiment and so and did my platoon leader time. But I had the same kind of, you know, I think everybody who has that experience, everybody, you know, they come, you come in and everybody kind of looks at you and says, what are you doing here? Um, second Lieutenant. And I'm like, well, didn't really have a choice. Um, you know, okay. Army's not big on giving second Lieutenant choices. So yeah. <laughs> and I actually had a similar experience. You know, I found, uh, you know, as you know, and probably, I think probably some listeners know, I, I, you know, I wound up doing finance uh, and I had kind of my, like you, I had kind of my first encounters with finance uh, during that, um, you know, but I didn't, but I did not get to finance makes you wait a little while longer. So I didn't get to come around to that for a few more years, but anyway. Yeah. Okay. See, that's, that's right, good. So, see, no, I just want to put you on, on the spot with everybody okay. else. It's only, yeah. <laughs> it's only yeah. right. Oh, and this, this is going to be a, for those listeners, this can be a continuing theme throughout this. Yes. <laughs> of course he kind of cuts all that out later. I, I might just edit it all out. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> see if I see as that I get last say, so we'll see. Uh, so you went to right. what kind of unit? You went to a medical brigade. So yeah, so I went to a medical brigade. I got, um, immediately transferred over to Europe. This is right as Kosovo is kicking off. So uh, right as Y two K finished, uh, January of two thousand, I get 
I get orders actually in like November of two uh, 99. Uh, then I go to my next unit. It is January of 2000 and immediately get deployed to Kosovo. So that was, yeah, so that was, that was fun. That was when Kosovo was just heating up a hospital that I was assigned to down there was all intense. Um, I had, I was actually assigned to my unit, came in on a Friday and Monday. I was actually in the, in the field or basically I gathered all my equipment, gathered my gun, my equipment, and then I met everybody in a training exercise out in the field by I think Wednesday the next week and then ramped up. And within six weeks or so, I was in Kosovo. So you just said, you know, you went to a field unit, but then you said I went to a hospital. So help help our listeners yeah. on what, what we're talking sure. about. Sure. So you know, you, you have hospitals, obviously, at, at every, from, from the time people get, get wounded all the way back to these large facilities that we talk about. We think of your Walter Reed, your large hospital systems within the military or the large hospital systems that civilians are in. But, but we also have these really cool capabilities within the military to be able to basically replicate most of the services that you would get in a fixed facility in tents. I mean, it's amazing the amount of the amount of things that can be done uh, in austere conditions uh, within the military. And I, I was always impressed with being able to take and within. You know, we used to train all the times to be able to take these hospitals out, drive them to the middle of nowhere, all on the back of trucks, or sometimes at Fort Bragg, we jump, you know, throwing them out the back of of airplanes. You'd have these these large containers that would drop them somewhere, and then within eighteen hours. You have a full-on hospital. You have four OR suites. You have you have OR capabilities or operating room capabilities within less than an hour. Then you have holding capabilities where you're actually doing, you know, gosh, things like you know, full-on lab, uh, radiology with CT scans, all these other things within 24 hours. And then I would go in as they're setting up and start laying in, as they're laying in the 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 power and the water, we'd start laying in communications. And there was a specific way we do it. And I found that I really, really love that environment. I mean, I'm from a small town. We've talked about this a ton of times. We're from small town, Kansas. You're going to tell me I get to go be a computer guy to really think through hard problems, solve tough, challenging things in challenging situations, but I still get to carry a gun and I get to jump out of planes? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Does it get any better than that? It, not, <laughs> not from my foxhole, my friend. Yeah. So, so you, here we go. So you spent some time in Kosovo with this yeah. unit, and, and this is where you, this is kind of where you, it sounds like this is where you maybe had some, your first kind of really leadership role in that, in that 70 Delta, in that, in that information systems role as you're the information systems guy. Is that, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Then came back and was working in a station in Germany for about four and a half years, uh, but, but kind of deployed a lot back and forth to Kosovo. Um, and then had an opportunity, a rare opportunity, and something that you talk about those kind of the proud moments of your career. Um, I started really realizing that I loved being a leader. I loved, I, I knew it before, but, but to be a leader of soldiers was just a phenomenal thing uh, because of the responsibility, because of what you were able to do to be able to help each other out, to learn from each other throughout. Um, I was actually chosen to be what was called our our medical brigade headquarters commander. So it was, um, and I can I can always remember, it was 129 personnel I took, right? 129 personnel, took 112 of those to uh, the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And so in the first push in Iraq, the initial, the initial invasion, um, I was actually not an IT person at all, but was in the role of commander, which was in charge of, again, uh, making sure that everything from convoy operations to housing, feeding, securing, uh, moving people around the battlefield, uh, that was all uh, my responsibility. And it was just life-changing in a lot of ways, good and bad. Yeah. What kind of lessons did you learn in that, in that role and in that environment? So you're there, you're now you're uh, deployed again, but now in a, a little bit of a hotter um, environment, if you will. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Um, Physically and metaphorically. Yeah. You bet. I, so there were some things I saw quite a bit. That there was some amazing leadership that I learned. I know we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I had a couple of incredible mentors, 
some because they did phenomenally well. And, and there was a couple that, and quite frankly, from, from not doing the simple things, you saw otherwise brilliant, hardworking, dedicated people not do well at all and fail um, as leaders. Doing simple things like not taking care of themselves, not sleeping, right? Not getting enough sleep, thinking that you had to be there for all the decisions, not being able to trust your people. And I saw some uh, some, some people who just quite really didn't do as well uh, because of that. Uh, but it was, it was definitely a time to learn about trusting other folks. So you, you'd had at that point early in your career, you've had already, you know, a couple of deployments. When did you know you wanted to stay in the army and make it a career? What, what was the kind of, what was the moment? Yeah. So I was, I was there. We have a, a mutual friend of ours. That's also a researcher now. Um, and we were in coach flow together. We just had a great time. We were deployed. And I realized I, I really enjoyed this. And I really want to go be a, a battalion and brigade commander, which is, again, unheard of and not, there's not very many medical service corps officers that were able to then go and be a commander. There are some, uh, but they're in very specific fields, administrative, security, uh, medical logistics are usually the command group. Uh, but I really want to be a battalion commander and I want to be a brigade commander. I really just, I enjoy this. I want to be in charge of hundreds and then thousands of soldiers to really help them out. Um, and I think it was during, it was during that time in, in Kosovo. I had some friends. In fact, I just saw one of them, another, uh, retired by the name of Mark Morgan. He runs, uh, Eastern Oklahoma, uh, the VA medical center down there and just phenomenal human being. And he was just a great early mentor. And I realized this is kind of where I want to be. And I, I want to continue down this road. I want to go down that path. And even though I chose this, this community of being a, a, a chief information officer or an IT specialist. I just loved being a leader. Yeah. yeah. So more it, for you, it was always, it was more about the people and the problems than it was about the particular field, the particular subfield of, of working in health IT. Right. In fact, a lot of times, you know, I used to tell people all the time, especially as, as we get into two thousands, we're starting to see kind of leading up to like Oh seven, we have the release of, you know, the first iPhone, that sort of thing. Um, people would love to come and talk to me about, hey, give me, I want this technology, this technology. I always stop and go, wait, give me your requirements. What is it that you want to be able to do? I'll go back and, and talk about and, and think through the technology. But if you tell me how much money, how much time, and what you want to do, let me help you plan through that. Because the solution at the end of the day, and I keep on holding it up for you, Mark, my iPhone. Right, right. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's, right. it's for not the audience. He keeps up, keep holding hold, <laughs> up his iPhone to show me. That's right. It's my phone my, is. My iPhone 6. Um, yeah. No, not quite. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not exactly a laggard, but, um, but I really want to be able to solve the problem. Right? And so it is, in, it is in helping someone think through a really hard set of problems. Yeah. And then perhaps, perhaps there's technology that you can use to help us get to where we want to be. Uh, and sometimes it isn't. And that's okay as well. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So talk a little bit about kind of the flow of your career. Because um, I, I want to make sure we have time to talk about your current role and so forth. But uh, give me the arc of your career. So you have this early career. You discovered uh, health IT pretty early on. You made it out to the field. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of, uh, you know, you, you've kind of decided at some point really would like to um, you know, be a people manager, if you will. So you want to command a battalion, maybe brigade. So how does, what kind of, so tell me a little more about the flow of your career. Sure. So after that, I was totally focused. Um, and you talk about the failures, those things that don't do well. We can talk a little bit more about that later. But some of the things that I did early on were focused so much on my career that I tended to lose focus sometimes on, sometimes on what was really important, Right. Okay. Family time with time with family, um, refocusing on on them in between these hard hard and challenging times. As much as I said I did, I just yeah. I didn't I didn't early on. Um, so basically, I deployed to Kosovo, then went back to the first Iraq, um, came back, left left Europe, went to Fort Bragg, which is the home of the Airborne Special Operations. People jumping mm -hmm. out of planes. It was a great place. It was a field unit again. So I went from field unit to field unit. It was interesting at the time that a lot of my colleagues that were over me like, 
why, why are you spending all the time in the field? You need to focus on, you know, uh, managing in a fixed facility or a regular hospital and then this hospital. And my response always was it has less to do, it has very little to do with the facility you're in. It is how do I hone my skills as a leader? How do I hone yeah. my skills as, as, a, as an IT person, both competent and confident, right, in those skills? And so I found that in Europe, and I found at Fort Bragg, the ability to kind of go and spend the time to work on, you know, competence at the tactical level, then becoming more operational and eventually strategic and more of my thinking. Uh, but, but to be able to exercise that in places where I felt like I was as close to the tip of the spear as possible. What does that yeah. mean? What does yeah, that mean? So it's, it's a great music. Tip of, the tip of the spear, it sounds so, yeah. C- come on. I, the reality is I'm an IT person, right? I am a medical IT person. So for me, tip of the spear, and it means that, that you are there helping those that are on truly. You are, you are standing on the shoulders of giants. You are working next to the people that are doing really hard things every day. And it was my job to be able to help those individuals to include the physicians and nurses that are doing the hard work day to day to be able to give them the tools they needed to be able to save a life as far forward as possible. And so for me, that was, that was always really, really important. And I always felt like I had a, a, I knew exactly why I was there. And it didn't have to be the front, the most important person. In fact, that was okay not to be. But to know that I could really help as far forward, as close to those people that were actually in the fight as possible. So you were talking, so, so you're using a lot of slang that, that you and I are very comfortable with, but let me just kind of, oh, let me just gracious. interpret a little bit into, into civilian. What you're really saying was you wanted to be in a deployable unit that was a, a fighting unit supporting them or supporting the, 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 the medical support that was, that was actually going to support men and women who were actually going out and, and fighting, uh, fighting our nation's battles for us. Okay. Right. Right. Absolutely. So the spears, Thank you for translating you know, that. Yes. Yeah. I just, Thank I just, you. you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, so you kind of kept developing your skills in that environment. So this is an interesting point because, you know, as you know, I do research on careers. So what I heard you saying a minute ago, and I just want to kind of throw that in, maybe I'll just use this for research later. But um, what I heard you saying was people were giving you advice saying, you really need to come back to a fixed facility. You need to come back to a, a brick and mortar hospital and get out of those field units. Right. That's, that's exactly that's the message you were getting from yeah. the from the from the establishment. From the establishment, from a lot of my peers, from other people. But I, my response was, well, who else is going to come out here? Who else wants to do this? Because I love, I, I found a joy and a love in that environment. Right. Mm-hmm. Because there is there is a there is a sense of urgency that is in those units that you cannot replicate in other places. Periodically, yes. But, but not in the same way. So, so I, really, I really enjoyed that. And quite frankly, the people that were doing that work, I found were the ones who were most focused on the real reason I was there. And the real reason I was there was to serve my country, to be part of something bigger than myself, right? Um, and, and so I found a lot of, kind of kindred spirits there. Uh, yeah. People that I, I, you know, that I saw the world the same way. And so I didn't, I didn't concern myself with what is my right career path per se, but it was all about how well am I doing in this role right now? What is, what what do I need to do to be the best I can right now in this job? And so with that, and then with this feeling of sense of urgency, that was more than enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. Because the rest of it, I had some great mentors that said things like the rest of it, it will take care of itself. You do the right thing. You look for the hard job, and the rest will take care of itself. So, where did and how did you wind up going to Clemson to get a PhD <laughs> in policy? How'd that okay. happen? So, so there I was. There I was in Baghdad. <laughs> is that, <laughs> so the, all right. is, I was. It was second time. I just. All right. Feel free to edit all this out later. So. Um, I, I was in Baghdad. It was our s- second tour. This time I was working as the CIO. This is during what was called the surge uh, from around 06 to 08, 2006 to 2008, where there was a push of troops into Iraq. So we were going to really get to a new way. And General Petraeus had come up with this brilliant idea of how we're going to push forward in this campaign. 
And so it was a very, very busy time. Uh, right before I deployed, I, among other things, I, I was lucky enough to be picked up to do a, a PhD, right? So I was okay. called the, it was basically a long-term schooling. They let one person every two to three years in my field go back and do a PhD. Point for, for the good listeners out there, I did not get picked up the first time. Uh-huh. I did not get picked up the second time. I got picked up the third time. So I had actually applied before. I had a master's degree. People were like, look, you're doing it. And in fact, I didn't want to apply a third time. We were getting ready to deploy. I had, I had been building this team of about 20 young uh, communications and computer people that were just brilliant. And I was like, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. I'm done. And I had a good friend of mine and, and another mentor look out for me and say, you know, Mark, how long is it going to take you to fill this out? You know you want to do this. Maybe, maybe you should just try one more time. And so I did. And so I think that's another, you talk about certain themes. This is not a theme of easy wins. This is not a theme of, and if you, you follow this formula, this is how you'll be successful. No, this is about you get kicked a lot. You, you, you keep on getting back up. Um, and, and you decide, is this what I want to do? And so someone looked out for me. And they said, just, just do it one more time. And so right before we deployed, I found out that I had been picked up for, for long-term schooling. Wow. So, so I went down and, and I still remember, and I'll just kind of share just a very brief part of the story. I'm sitting with a good friend of mine, still one of my best friends by the name of Colonel Pat Staley. Uh, he just recently retired himself, another good medical service corps person perhaps to reach out to. And, He's, he said he was just, he was exactly like me. And I said just the opposite in that he was just quiet, <laughs> very to the point. Um, and he was so funny. And one day we're sitting there and there were rockets were coming in and we were kind of sitting underneath some <laughs> stuff waiting for the afternoon because there were morning mortars and then rockets and then evening mortars and rockets. And we're sitting in a room one day and we're kind of waiting these things coming. He said, hey, man, you ought to go to Clemson. And of course, anybody from South Carolina knows that Clemson, there's a P in there, although it's C-L-E-M-S-O-N, there's, it's actually an M-P-S-O-N. So I you go to Clemson, I'm like, okay. And, and so we get back in, dust ourselves off, and he's like, yeah, and this Strom Thurmond Policy Institute seems just right. And he was laughing. I was like, I'm, I'm from Kansas. Um, we're not big Strom Thurman fans there <laughs> and for a number of reasons that's a good reason and he's like yeah but, and then he just kind of stopped because he actually was he's a brilliant human being as well he just stopped and he's mark take a look at their program i mean like all of a sudden all the, the all the flowery words all stuff just reaches yeah. mark look at the program it's a brilliant interdisciplinary program <laughs> and so i looked at it i was like oh my gosh i know i want to solve and i was i knew right away that i was going to try to solve a problem because I was gonna to have to redeploy early to start school. And so I was determined to try to solve a problem that I knew we were having in Iraq at the time. And that was the completion of medical records in a deployed okay. environment so that it could go and help a soldier all the way through their life and then all the way to VA. Because without getting into it too much, if you have a medical record that is at the time that was in a deployed environment, and it was not, if you couldn't figure out a way for the, for the clinician to sign off and finish that record, it would never go through the rest of the medical, medical record system. It would never be lifelong or longitudinal, and it would never make it to VA, which caused a lot of problems for friends among other service members, people that had been hurt, blown up. And so I said, by golly, I'm going to solve that problem when I go back to school. Uh, that record, so let me just yeah. pause for a second. That record is important because if it's not signed off, then it kind of, it's vague mm-hmm. as to whether something actually happened, what actually happened. And that is important for establishing eligibility for, for benefits and other things right. down the line, but, but also just for the immediate treatment of the, of the soldier too, right? So absolutely. So it's important for both of those reasons, Mark. Thanks for laying that out. One is at the time, I need to make sure that during the time people are being evacuated, they're not carrying pieces of paper with them with the evacuation. That electronic record should flow ahead of the patient, ideally, 
so that the next facility that's going to gain or get that evacuated person knows ahead of time, what equipment do I need? What doctors and nurses do I need on staff? What, what kind of facilities do I need to be prepared for? And how long am I going to hold them in that location? So there's that important thing that goes through. Also, because if you think of it this way, if you don't know what someone did in a surgical intervention early on, you're going to have to reopen that person up to make sure things were done correctly. Right? Which happened a fair amount. It right? happened, yes, like a fair amount. Watches. Absolutely. This is not anecdotal. Right. right. Um, the other thing, and to your point, is that long term, after a service member leaves military service, they become eligible, perhaps, for, for VA coverage. But not everyone knows that just because you served, you don't get all of your care immediately at the Veterans Affairs. There has to be oftentimes, it is very beneficial and helpful to the veteran to understand if something is service related. And if it's combat related, it's even more important. And so that can be tied to lifelong service. It can be tied to additional monies to be able to help you as you move forward. So for all those reasons, I said, I have to be able to work to solve that problem. But let me back up for one second, then we'll go forward. Um, you, you tried three times. It took three times. So you were really, it, this was not like a casual, like, oh, maybe I'll go to, to grad school. It was a thing you really wanted to do. Yes, yes. Why? I, I why? Why? You already had a master's degree. You had a triple major, a two, double major, right? Or, double, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Major, minor, you know. So. Oh, whatever. Um, yeah. So why? Because I wanted to be the best at whatever I was doing. Yeah. Right? And so I wanted to be the best at what I was doing. Um, it, it was, again, I had a couple mentors that had done a similar path that was so odd, so different that you would spend all your time in the field and then also be an academic. To me, that, would, that just sounds so, that sounds so cool, so wonderful to be able to do both, right? To be able to have a, a foot in, here's the action of what's happening right now. And then something that you could um, go and perhaps be a teacher, to go and to help, to be able to solve other problems, to, um, to challenge yourself. So yes, I did. And, and I, thought it was, I thought it was cool. And I grew up and quite frankly, to my parents, I will, I will tell you that, you know, my parents in the household I grew up in, I know you grew up in a fairly similar house and that uh, it wasn't what school are you going to? It's so what kind of graduate education are you going to be? <laughs> are you going to you know, right. go after and where are you going to graduate from? And, and for my family, it was a bunch of attorneys. So uh, all the, my father, my grandfather, great grandfather, they were all attorneys as well. So everybody was infantry, everybody was attorney. So then they're like, so you're going to be one, a medic. Then part of it was kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so one, you're going to be a medic. And two, you're going to be a what? Uh, in, my, in my house, it was even, even as I graduated, it was, it was known as my piled higher and deeper. Yes. That's your piled exactly. higher and deeper. <laughs> yes. That was your piled higher and deeper. I'm like, okay. Nice. All right. So it's, you know. That's fun. Yeah, it's a so why you, not, you, right? Yeah. So you went to Clemson, you studied. So how did, how did this tie into this mission that you were trying to execute, this, this, sure. this, yep. this problem you wanted to solve? So, so, you know, again, one of those recurring themes is it's not about the technology itself, right? And as a CIO, I would argue that it's not about the technology itself. It is how we can use that technology. I knew that the problems that we were try I was trying to solve had little to do with technology itself. It had very little to do with, and so I, I kind of got rid of any idea of going and thinking about computer science. Then I looked at a couple of B schools, business schools, and quite frankly, uh, classic, classic ideas of, of uh, return on investment or TAM modeling, which is technology acceptance modeling. Those are kind of some of the things to look at at the time. Those weren't of interest to me. I wanted to be able to, I believed that I could solve the problem understanding two things, and that was colors of money and what that means for the military. And I will explain this, Dr. Bonica. Um, <laughs> you have different pots of money that can be used for certain things. And if you don't understand how the complexities of, of, of finance within the military, it's hard for you to get things done. As anybody that's in the field that you were in, Mark, you loved to be able to hoard the fact and to lord other people that we are the masters of all, of all dollars, therefore we control right. everything. That's Just right. so you know, oh great listeners, 
That is exactly <laughs> the role that Bonica was in. And he <laughs> reveled in that. And he that's was really true. good at it. That's so, true. <laughs> so, I don't so know about the had, good part, but I definitely did revel in that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I decided to study an interdisciplinary program, which was a mix of political science and economics. And so that's how later when I got to, to Baylor, you and I got along so well. Well, so it's so you get it. We're both named Mark. We're both yeah. don't show any pictures of me as part of this podcast. We're both incredibly good looking men <laughs> and talented. <laughs> but but we both have this 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 passion for trying to solve complex problems and thinking about things a little bit differently and thinking about things from a dare I say a classical perspective. Mm -hmm. okay? And so that's what, I, that's what I did. And so I thought it was good. So I studied public policy as a tool to be able to solve problems in the theater of operations. And what was fun is a couple years after I finished and after you and I got together and we got to hang out at, at the Baylor program uh, for a couple years and teach, I got to put a lot of those policies into action in Afghanistan. Yeah. 2012. Well, let's, yeah. let's, you know, we'll segue fairly quickly. Sir. So you finished Please. the program. <laughs> We were at we were, we had the opportunity to serve together in in the army's uh, very own masters in healthcare administration program. We had a, a really good time uh, working with uh, uh, kind of mid career uh, leaders who were coming through the program to earn their their master's degree. And I stayed on, and you like left almost as soon as you could. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of so how I remember. Yeah, that, okay, so she like, so I remember you <laughs> abandoning me there. That's so, right now, kind of, so, yeah. Yeah, so anybody, yeah. anybody that was there on faculty at the time, please don't listen to the next couple minutes because it's absolutely true that Bonica just found a lot less utility in the program after I left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding at all. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so what I did when we were there, we were, we were teaching, you really, you were focused on, um, you know, working inside the graduate school, you were doing a ton of other things in graduate school. Uh, I had, again, this kind of duality, right? So while I was doing the teaching, I was also working on the, uh, what's called the assignments or how are we gonna move the other people in my field, the IT community, how, what kind of assignments can I get them? And so it was to me a good way to kind of keep a foot in academia and a foot uh, in, other, in other ways. They, there also was some, some family issues and some, Family is like, it's too hot in San Antonio. I'm going to say my, my dear, loving wife. <laughs> She's like, yeah. I'm melting here. It was that. But it really was the idea of getting back into the operational world, which I just, again, if, if I wanted to do those things like battalion command and, and go on from there, that's where I needed to be. And so I had a call. And again, the same, in fact, it was the same person I was joking about earlier, uh, the great Pat Staley. Hey, man, you want to go to Afghanistan? <laughs> All right. So at this point, he was a pretty senior guy in a, in a medical unit. And he and a couple, a number of other uh, gentlemen and, and ladies I had worked with at Fort Bragg were going to do one more deployment in Afghanistan together as, as a pretty senior staff. And so they asked me to, to come with them. And I, I did. So, yes. And you got to you got to work on this problem that, the, that you had actually done your dissertation about and, and studied. So you yep. actually worked on the, the problem of, of, of completing the records. You bet. And so, and using tools that we talk about all the time, right? In, in economic theory and in political science, the idea of ex post ex ante control mechanisms, things like, you know, uh, you can't create, I can't create an incentive structure for military officers to do their work. I can't say I'm going to pay you more like you could on the civilian side. So what are those things I can do? I can monitor you, I can sanction, I can do other things. And so without getting into it, because she's, by the way, folks, Bonica just leaned back in his chair. It's like, oh, here comes Milan again. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to talk about his ex push control mechanisms. Um, <laughs> but absolutely. So we've got to put some of these things in, into, into play and at the same time really kind of solve some problems with communications and, and some other policy issues, which is just a lot of fun. Yeah. So that's pretty cool because, I mean, you know, a lot of us academics study stuff um, and talk a lot about it and write papers about it, but not a lot of people wind up taking a plane into a war zone and trying to implement the thing that we've been, you know, theorizing about. So that's kind of cool. It was fun. And I really, really came back and did publish some 
pretty mediocre, uh, mediocre uh, papers out there. So <laughs> pretty excited about that. <laughs> like, nice. oh, wow. Uh, one of which you helped me work on. Thank you so much, because otherwise it wouldn't have seen the light of day. So at least, uh, yeah, you actually made it uh, palatable to a, to a uh, we'll call it a, a, a Z-level journal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was fun to be able to write about and to, to be uh, able to We won't mention. We won't mention. So, uh, right. <laughs> so, you, so, so let, uh, I want to kind of, I want to make sure we have time to talk about your Cerner experience. So let me, uh, you, kinda, you came back and, and, and continued to kind of work at, you, you came back and it's, I think you basically worked at the headquarters level after that. So kind of the headquarters of the Army Medical Department first, and then ultimately at the um, Defense Health Agency, which was, right. was standing up at the time. Talk about some of the kind of broadly talk about some of the problems you were working on and what you were what you were working on, you know, as you came toward the end of your career. Sure. And so, you know, I was coming in and this is going to be the next step towards battalion command to go back to that, that thing that I was actually focusing towards in, in the end. Um, and so was able to uh, work on operational medicine, some kind of how do I write policy at the highest levels to make sure that these programs are funded over time. So got to do that a little bit, got to work with our uh, then certain general, um, the great Patty Horaho, who's a certain general for the Army. I know you'd worked with. Uh, Just emailed with her today, as a matter of fact. Did you really? That's yeah, outstanding. Um, she's a great American. And so got a chance to work with her and some other folks on a thing that was called at the time the performance triad. And it was really interesting because to me it was fascinating because it was, this was early on we start talking about quantified self. And we start talking about this movement of how do I, uh, really measure individual behaviors um, through things like now that's so ubiquitous, um, Fitbits, things like that, I can check steps, things like that. And so she had this, this really novel idea and this wonderful idea of, of going after um, the knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, and how can I use technology as an enabler to be able to do these things to increase the amount of sleep soldiers are getting, activity that they do every day, um, and the nutrition that what do they actually put in their bodies for fuel? And to think about things it was a lot of fun at this level to think about not only that which was important to the warfighter, which is increasing strength, lethality on the battlefield, those sorts of things, being the best soldier you can be, but also as a, as a medical community, how can you start getting into what she used to always call the white space? And so mm -hmm. you're only with your physician yeah. 90 minutes, with your clinician 90 minutes on average per year as a soldier. So what do I do the rest of the time to focus you so that you're living a better life, that you're you're doing better, you're healthier? And so I was able to work on the technology piece, uh, was able to be an assistant investigator on that uh, large five-year study, uh, and then also to do some contracts work as well. So again, kind of be able to play with that. Uh, and so did that. And then finally, my last job was to be able to work and lead the, uh, the innovation and research for health information technology over the, at that point, scanning up the defense health agency. So it was a lot of fun with some new people. Yeah. So, yeah. so how did you come to the, so this is a, you know, uh, we, we, you participated in a study that our friend that I and, and our friend Chris are working on. We talked a little bit about this, but how did you come to a decision? You know, I mean, everybody, everybody sooner or later leaves the army. Um, so how did you come to that decision at, at the point that you did? So I did. And you were doing you were doing this amazing work, right? Um, uh, so I was again doing mediocre work, but I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so there I was, and I had actually was able to, as my first year, an alternate to what's called the Army's War College, which is exactly what set you up to go be a commander. It was uh, an alternate for the battalion command list, and yay! I was really excited. My first look at these things. And it was moving to where I wanted to be, um, and I went home. And I will tell you that all the all the deployments, uh, but most most specifically that that last deployment to Afghanistan um, was really hard on the family. And there I am, and we're about we're at the precipice. This is where I want to be next. And I had a very frank conversation. What does this mean for the family? And I said we have to move. Probably about three times in four years. Do we want to do this? And I was open and honest, and and my my wife was open and honest. And our family can't do that. We just can't do it. And I will tell you, I had focused and focused and focused. And everybody told me, you'll know when it's when you're ready to retire from the military. And I focused and focused and focused. And at that moment, Mark, we've talked about this before. 
I just knew, I was like, okay, I'm done. And I never looked back. I didn't feel bad about it. I didn't, uh, there was no regret. I had done everything I could. I felt like I'd given, you know, the measure and then that I could to my country. And so when I saw that look in her eyes and, you know, I talked to all my kids, um, we just knew. And, and that was it. And so yeah. drop papers and within a year, yeah, did the transition of moving moving forward. I know we want to talk a little bit about transitioning, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, you know, um, so, so I, I am curious, or, well, so I know your story, but I, but I think it's a useful thing to talk about because I think a lot of people, we've talked about this, thank you for your service stuff. And, and I don't mean to diminish it too much. I mean, but you come to the end of a career like that, where you've done as much as you have, you know, multiple deployments and a lot of sacrifice. Um, uh, so what was it like? Uh, and you said you made the decision with your family and, and you didn't look back. But I mean, what was it like to, to realize that it was over? It was, it was actually kind of how do I say, the best word I could think of to describe it. It was kind of quiet or, yeah. you know, it was, it was just kind of, this is okay. It was, it was peaceful. Um, I, I had put my family through a lot. And, and again, I'm telling you, and, and brother, we talk about this all the time. I, I did not have a hard career compared to a lot of folks. Um, I, I was able to serve those people that did really, really hard work. I was hopefully able to make their lives a little bit better or, you know, be able to help them on some of their absolute worst days that they ever had, hopefully. But, you know, anything I did was just, just paled in comparison to some, just some amazing people that just, this small group of people in our society that have sacrificed so, so very much, I just felt it was, it was right. And so when it came time to, to hang it up, I was more than okay. It's, yeah. okay. it's, uh -huh. it's, it's time. I, you know, wish people all the best. And, and I, I am so lucky to still be on the green side of the grass and to be able to, um, to, to have been able to serve some of those wonderful people. So you, you ultimately land at CERN. Uh, so I'll ask you a little bit about that. But what was the process like? So you've been, like, when was the last time you applied for a job prior to that? Yep. So, <laughs> so <laughs> let me see. So as I'm waiting to go back on active duty as an officer, I commissioned about ready to go back into become an officer. I remember loading 55-gallon drums on the back of a truck as, as part of a temp agency, which is awesome. So nice. now I'm coming out it's a little bit later, right? A, a couple more skills, hopefully. So here's what I did. Again, man, you succumb to the process, right? And so for me, it was, let's, let's jump in. And it was doing things like, and I'll just kind of lay out a few things. One, getting on social media, understanding social media, because quite frankly, because of security clearances and things like that, and I just, it was really messy. I, I was never much into social media. And so focusing on LinkedIn, learning, listening to anybody who had anything to say, even if at the end, I'm like, that's bad advice. I would listen to that <laughs> advice. I, again, I succumbed to the process. I, that was something that for me, was, I was really lucky when I went to grad school. Unlike you, my friend, uh, I, it was, it was an eye opener. After about a month in grad school, I was like, ooh, I need to go jump out of planes again because this ain't for me. And so <laughs> I had opportunity Trust to- Trust me, I was there, yeah. Uh, was there. To, to daily check my hubris at the door. <laughs> so for me, it was, I, hey, just check your hubris at the door. I already learned, I am not, the army teaches you, you're never the fastest. You're never the strongest. There's always somebody bigger and badder than you. Grad school, whew, in a different way, let me know. <laughs> and also let me know that my wife is the smartest person I know. Um, so I just checked the universe at the door and I started just getting after it. So went into LinkedIn, started, um, started to learn from other people, started to network. And what does network really mean? Gosh, not asking for jobs but just learning from other people, right? Hey, can I take you to coffee? I'm not asking for a job. In fact, that's how I got my job was um, somebody on one of the schools I was teaching for. They're like, hey, can I, can I just take, you? I asked them, can I take you to coffee? I'm not looking for a job, anything like that. I just love to learn from you. And so all those things, the, you know, we've talked, I probably put in right around, literally around a hundred applications of yeah. all types, right? So most of the time it was just to learn. 
right? So it was, some were just cold. Some were based on networks. Um, people say, hey, you should try this job. You should look here. Um, I went through the process of, in the government called senior executive service. And that's the highest level of government positions. Um, and, and most of those positions are not political appointees, but you have to go through this huge process of writing. And, and for me, it was absolutely fab, fantastic experience because it was a lot of writing and nowhere in there are you supposed to talk about we. The way those things are set up, you have to talk about I. And I'm going to tell you, that was the hardest thing after 24, almost 25 years of we do things together. It's not, I don't, I don't teach at Baylor. We teach Mark and I teach at Baylor. Right? We teach again. We had some great students. It was always about the students. It was about other things. It wasn't about us. And so I learned that process of writing about I and being more comfortable with that. Still not very comfortable, but <laughs> I tried. Uh, yeah. And so I just I jumped into it. Jumped into yeah. it. Talked to mentors. Talked to anybody who'd listen. And I and I guess the last thing I'll say is I spent the time doing it. So even though I was working full time teaching, um, I had to give time. There's no excuse for not spending the time going through this process, right? So that's what I did. So, um, what do I mean? What do firms get when they hire somebody out of the military? You know, I think a lot of people. Like I was talking with a, a friend. I just did an interview myself not too long ago, and it was a, a friend of mine here at, on campus that has a podcast, and he talked to me. And he said, "You know, what is it that?" Uh, what is it that, that military veterans bring to the, you know, what, what, you know, to the, uh, to the job is, is it like, you know, being on time and stuff I'm like, well, yeah, it's that. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that. So what would you say? Um, you know, okay. We know how to show up. We know how to, you know. Yep. So we know how to lead. I mean, there is the soft skills piece, but the, anybody that lays back on their laurels and they talk just about the soft skills, the ability to lead, or I've led hundreds of people in combat. I've done these things. That's awesome. But that's kind of, those soft skills are very, very important once you land a job. Yeah. They are, they are not the thing that's going to get you in the door. Unless, of course, you are going to go work for an agency that just wants to have your Rolodex or your list of names yeah. and people that you want to talk to. So for me, it is, you have to be honest about translating your skill set, you know. Um, oftentimes, we'll say, because I ran a hospital I was the same as a CEO in the military. No, no a commander is different. And you need to have, be kind of honest about those things, yeah. right? Um, it, it doesn't necessarily translate well all the time. Now, I was, I was lucky enough to be able to find, find a place where I could utilize hard skills, right? So my education, all these other things that I worked on, um, my knowledge as a CIO, and then also uh, some soft skills to include leadership. So my answer to my friend was, uh, I think, it, and it goes back to what you were saying about I versus we, was what I think you get when you get somebody, when you get a veteran is, yeah, from day one, your respect and, you know, timeliness and all those kind of very basic uh, behaviors are, are enforced. But the, probably the bigger uh, and more subtle one is that, that team focus. I, w- I would also add in there, you know, something I talk a lot about. Um, with groups is the values that that oftentimes in we have to help um, the outside understand what that means. And we're a values based organization. The military is value based organization, right? And so I always tell people, what does that mean? If I hire somebody from the military, I know there's certain things that they're going to be able to do, right? I don't have to go in and think about their values, especially if you spend a career in the military. You're going to understand loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Those are those values. Those are the army values that are just, quite frankly, pretty well literally beaten into your head over 20 <laughs> some years. Uh, and that's, of course, the acronym for leadership, right? Uh, but those values and, and know, know that everything that comes with that, the second, third order effects of being a values-based leader, that's, that's enormous. And so I can just cut to the chase and just know those things right off the bat. That's tricky if you're not a vet hiring another vet of how to be able to show that. And you have to show that over time. And a lot of that has come with, again, checking the hubris at the door. So you landed at Cerner. Let's, uh, yes. let's talk a little bit about Cerner. Um, what is Cerner? 
for sure. folks who are not uh, you know familiar. So it's a great company. It's out of it's based out of Kansas City. I'm lucky enough to be uh, here when I first was hired on. I was the only exec that was living here in the DC area all the time. Uh, in 2015, so they're a health IT company. They do <clears throat> traditionally they were known as an electronic medical record company. And they operated in about 30 different countries, 27, 28,000 people in the company spread all over the world. Um, the system itself works in about 10 different languages currently, but there has been a fundamental shift over the last few years. And really it's become less and less about being electronic medical records and more about data and knowledge. And so that's really been an exciting shift. And I've been able to be here now for three years as we're seeing this kind of this paradigm shift continue within this company. Specifically, the area I work in is I work for our government services group. So, Center Government Services. In 2015, they were part of the Lidos Partnership for Defense Health Group. We were a sub uh, for all the updating all of the Department of Defense medical records. So, how do you go to a new medical record system? Then, in 2018, uh, we won the uh, we were we were given the opportunity to now have the uh, the Veterans Affairs, the Department of Veteran Affairs, um, the contract to update those that medical record system, which was based on, and quite frankly, they were the they were one of the really early adopter of electronic medical records. Mm-hmm. The system that was called Vista. It's absolutely brilliant. It was way ahead of its time, um, but now we're going to be able to modernize that to bring it into more of a commercial, very much like a commercial environment. And so now we're going to have an interoperable record or the same record from DOD from the time you come into the military to the time you leave the military to the time you leave and you're a veteran through the end of your life. And so it is a true lifelong longitudinal record and it is the single largest health IT project ever. Uh, and so I'm able to uh, be an exec on that, on the team that's doing some, just some amazing work uh, and really getting after it every day. So, like, just to give folks a, a sense of the scale that we're talking about there, DOD is, how many records are we talking about? So, so we're talking yeah. about, about 9.5 million people that are that are part of the DOD system. Then you're talking about another, gosh, nine, nine or so million. We talk about 20 million veterans, but about 7 million are actually actively in the VA system. Um, you're talking about, just on the VA side, about 1,240, 1,241 facilities. Um, and then for the Department of Defense, you're talking about global. So that's the U.S. Department of Defense everywhere. So anywhere we have, we have, we have these fixed facilities, these large hospitals or these clinics, we're going to be working on them. So this is, this is huge. We just finished a project in, in October where we brought in all the records from the VA. And so for those few, the tech folks that are on listening, the one or two that are out there, um, <laughs> we brought across all VISTA data for all, all veterans for all time. That was basically about 50 terabytes of data that is being ingested into our healthy, what's called our, our population health platform called Health Intent. And so with that, and as we're turning on systems within the DOD, this is just, this is enormous. It's one of those things that gives me a sense of mission, very much like the military, that I'm yeah. serving my community. I get to still serve people that, that I've cared so much about and actually seeing something that I wrote about, right? This idea of you got to make this lifelong longitudinal record and now I get to work on it in, in a way I could have never imagined. For my students who are young, you, you know, uh, uh, undergrads who are getting ready to go, they've heard about electronic health record, but why is that important? Why is that like a revolution or, or is, why is that a, na- why are these things enabling a revolution? You talked a minute ago about data and knowledge. Uh, maybe kind of tie that together to why is this important? Why do we care? Sure. So, so it used to be the electronic medical record, right? Which is just a record of an electronic medical record. What, what happens within the healthcare facility or when, within one time that you're being seen by a physician. And then the medical record is every time you're being seen by a physician over and over in time. So it gives you kind of a lifelong idea of what happens in the facility. The electronic health record, and really what we're talking about is everything else, Right. What about Fitbit data? What about uh, anything that has to do with, we're now working a lot in things like social determinants of health. Uh, we're starting to do some work in toxic exposures and to try to get after things that, that are gonna be happening outside of just 
the, the brick and mortar, mortar facilities, right? What are those things we can do to create a, a better, healthier veteran, better, healthier service member that is, that is medically ready to go do what they need to do? To me, I think the, you know, the deployment of a well-run medical record allows for, you mentioned population health and, and, and determinants of health and things like that. I mean, you can't really do that kind of work without a good, uh, a good medical record underlying all that, right? That's right. And with that, no, you're exactly right. And now we're going to kind of go into more of the idea of, we we'll call it the big the buzzwords these days, right? So ML, machine learning, um, the idea of, of AI, right? Um, which is fast math, right? So super fast math. What, what, what can we really do? We can start thinking about things and, and not just be able to give data to someone, but to be able to create perhaps cl better clinical decisions. Have you considered this? Have you thought about this? Here's something else that you should consider. You may want to run these other tests. Here's some other things that you would never have been able to see had you not had the data put together in a way that is uh, one that is actionable and that not just at the point of care, which is hugely important, but we're, we're gonna get to the point in the next few years, we're really trying to get after getting in front of things before they have, right? So not just predictive decisions, but absolutely predictive, prescriptive down the road. And so that's what we're really working for every day. And so it's, I still get to do uh, some work in that area that I get to work with veterans and with other folks, but then I get to do some work in our Kind of some research with some of our folks as well. And so it's a lot of fun to be able to work with, with this great group of folks and kind of the culture of this organization. So the job you're in now, you're working with the VA implementation. That wasn't actually happening when you first got there. So kind of talk a little bit about making that transition into civilian life and, and, and into Cerner, right? Um, and what was that like? And, and kind of advice to other veterans in terms of making that transition to that, maybe that first role post-military? Sure. So it was it was really about showing value, right? And I was very focused on what I thought was going to be my biggest value to the organization. Um, I struggled a little bit. I, I actually did. I struggled a little bit because what I thought was value to the organization wasn't as value to the organization. That, that's great, Mark, but we need you to do this. We need you to work on a cyber solution. We need you to work on a uh, another solution that means a lot to us. Please go do that. Yeah, but I want to do so much more. I want to just go and, yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Solve for this first. Yeah. And, and Was that a cultural another. issue? Like you just, you didn't, you weren't able to kind of process what was important to the organization because of different values or different, different perspective that you had to kind of learn? Well, one, it was, I was hired to be able to solve for a very specific problem, right? That they were having in the department kind of in the deployed environment and how can we work towards solutions, uh, the future of those solutions. That, that was great, but I'd spent so much time thinking about that. I wanted to go think about something else. And, and there were some, I had some struggles understanding how to better align with the organization. And I'll be very honest about that. That was, uh, that was mostly me. And that I needed to understand what does the organization need from me? Not just, hey, I come in and I see problems because we do that, right? In the military, you go and you try to solve, okay, I see the problem. Let's go fix this, this, and this. Yeah, that's fine. We need you to solve for this first because this is, this is the real, this is our most pressing issue. Mm -hmm. And so being able to understand that, uh, especially as you kind of, you spend a career kind of leaning forward, leaning forward, um, wanting to do everything that you can for everybody, Sometimes it is. It's let's focus on this one task at hand, show value there, and then move forward. And I think that's that's a lesson that I've kind of had to learn the hard way. <laughs> right? Yeah. There you go. Um, it sounds like Cerner is doing some really exciting things. What's most exciting to you, kind of about what's going on at Cerner, or kind of going on in the health IT field right now? Sure. So I think probably one of the most exciting things right now that's going on with Cerner is that, and it's for me, it's 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 a perfect fit now that I have found some way that I can help the company, that I can be of value to the company and still feel like I'm, I'm absolutely serving the community I come from. That no kidding, that I get, that what I can, what I'm doing now, I can draw a line to helping someone down the road. I'm actually going to help, you know, uh, 
service members, their families and veterans based on the work that we're doing now. If, if for me personally, if I couldn't find a way to make that work, then I, I, I would probably be struggling a lot more. Uh, but, but I found that that's something that the company, the company needs help with. Is there a commercial company that's in the space and they're really, they really, really care, but not always just, just is caring enough. It is caring and also understanding. It's the cultural competency that goes along with that. It is understanding um, the veterans groups and what they bring, what they bring to the table, right? Um, and why it's so important to be able to get things right for them. Everybody wants to serve, they want to do the right things, but being able to kind of help guide those efforts, that's, that's actually really cool. And so for me, uh, I seem to have found a place where I can do that and they still allow me enough flexibility to work a few research initiatives on the side and do some other things. And they're allowing me to continue to, to teach and to be able to hang out with folks like you and, and talk about these things and you know, be active on social media for crying out loud. It's crazy, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, let's transition and talk just for a couple of minutes about leadership. What would you say is your, your leadership philosophy? What, what, have you, what have been your guiding principles as a leader? Okay, so right now I'm looking through all the questions that you sent me. I'm looking for those right now. So that's a great question. Let's talk about leadership. Ah, yes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm such an academic because I took copious notes ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, some goals, some goals. Um, so I would say my, my leadership philosophy is pretty simple. Right? It, it is based on a couple of things. So the one is trust, right? That you're going to trust people to do what's right. That they're going to do it when no one's looking. I think those are one of those big things that goes to, again, that goes back to that idea of a values-based leadership, right? So to trust to do what's right. And for me personally, to try to forgive myself all the time because I screw up all the time, but to try to be the best version of who I am as a leader, not what I did yesterday, but what's my best version of where I want to be. If you, when you have the opportunity to hire leaders and bring leaders on board, what are you, what are you looking for in them? So that's kind of your philosophy. What do, you, what do you look for in a leader when you're evaluating, hiring and evaluating one? Sure. Well, so one is, so we do actually in, in our hiring, um, they do a really good job of kind of focusing on competency, focusing on specific questions to ask and specific interviews. Um, I do tend to. Uh, and, and relish in the fact that I understand if someone is a values-based leader based on ex- based on certain experience. The flip side of that is that doesn't give you an automatic pass either, right? And I think that's important for people to understand. Like there's some sort of secret handshake that you can do, and you can wave something, and all of a sudden you can get you can get in. But I think the idea of you know, are you competent in the position that we need? And quite frankly, even more than that. Are you willing and do you desire to grow? Right? Do you want to, are you ready to solve this problem? Like I wasn't in some ways. Maybe I wasn't as ready as I should have been to be able to solve a problem. But are you, are you hungry to know? Are you hungry to learn? And will you take calcul- some calculated risks? That's, that's definitely what I'm looking for. You mentioned mentor, mentors a couple of times. Your friend, your friend that kind of told you to do that third try and, and then brought you back to Afghanistan. Uh, mm-hmm. How have mentors played a role in your, in your career, in your life? And, you know, what makes a good mentor? Sure. So I will tell you, I, I, was, I was really lucky growing up. I had a father who just, who had been a leader and had been a leader in combat and really understanding. He's just, he's a very simple, very kind person. Um, and he always taught me about not taking, not caring about who gets the credit, right? Even if, even if sometimes that gets you burned a little bit, that, that you may not get the recognition you deserve. Son, it was, son, don't worry about the credit. That stuff takes care of itself. And so, you know, this, this whole idea of being selfless. The other thing I had this, this great mentor, and I'll just tell you for a second. It was to be able to kind of, I guess, the classic version of to know yourself and to know your people and to know yourself. He had this great idea. So when we were getting ready to go to to Iraq the first time as a company commander, I would have to sit in his office at night from like, I don't know, eight to nine every night, 
most nights we would be sitting there and he he would quiz me every day about my people. Well, what about this person? How many kids do they have? What about this? Do they have this? You know, what kind of, and it's what well, it started with simple stuff about supplies. Do you have the supplies? Do you have the training? Do you have the thing that you need to go for? And then it became much more about, well, what about Joe? What about Joe's spouse? What about the kids? And his philosophy, and I'll never forget it. He said, Mark, I want you to be able to know what every one of your 129 people look like walking away from you at 100 meters in the dark. His idea, his country way of saying that um, was basically to say, you have to know these people. You have to know how they walk. You don't have to know they live. You have to know everything that you can about them. And you have to have a hunger to know more and more about your folks so that you truly, because that's, that's true caring. True caring isn't being soft. It's not being fluffy. It's not getting hugs all the way around. It is about actually giving enough of a brat's rear end to to really want to know about them, to want to know about them as people. And, and we would focus on this. And we'd focus on even if you were removing somebody from the military, right? You, you were doing something that just was really hard at the time. I, you're just not going to have a career anymore. But by God, it always has to come from a, a, a point of caring about that person. You know what? The Army just didn't write for you. That's okay. Here's what we're going to do to make sure that you're set up for the next career path. Or here's some advice for them to give you. Or... Let's just listen. If you had to pick a book that an early careerist who aspires to uh, ultimately to be a senior leader should read, do you, do you have one that, that had a particular influence on you or that you would like to recommend? Yep. So I'll just give you kind of a little bit. I will tell you that if you're an early career, something I will start really general and I'll get kind of specific. Um, I would say you need to start by reading something about a member of something greater than themselves. So that's a, that's more of a, that's not even a genre of literature. It is, it is a point of view. It is literature in a point of view. And that is any story or a story that focuses on something that is bigger than you. And what I mean by that is something for me, for the idea of like being an IT person, right? Um, at the end of the day, you're solving problems for people, right? So something right. at the nexus of people, problems, data for decision that reads wisdom and so if you're in health it something really just a couple of these right so why so lee's if disney ran your hospital okay. interesting way of interesting way of thinking differently about the system itself um wooden wooden on leadership right from a basketball coach i mean mm. that was his whole thing was all about leadership for um for students that you try every day it doesn't matter if you win or lose and he truly didn't but oh my goodness if he didn't give it you're absolute all every single time. Why are you even here? And so you add that question. Um, the idea of, again, something bigger than yourself. I'm just throwing it a bunch, right? So Mandela, right? Long walk to freedom. Mm. Talk about serving something bigger than yourself. Um, focus. And you talk about values based. Uh, and then lastly, I got to help for my military folks. Cause I really thought about this. Um, there was actually three books, but I'm just, I'll narrow it down to one. I promise Mark. Because, uh, dude, we read all the time, right? right. It's all like, all right, dude. Wow, I, everybody's there. Unleash Dr. Malott here. That's yeah. right, you did. <laughs> and, but the last one is, you know what? Simple book. Uh, go to Pink's To Sell as Human. Understanding what sales actually means. To Sell as Human. To Sell as Human by, yep, Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink. Uh, to all me, right. that's, that's one of those, you want to understand business and you're coming from, you're coming, I had a chip on my shoulder about sales and what sales is, and oh, psh, I'm not in sales. We're all in sales. You're a professor. Yeah. You are selling your program. You are selling the University of New Hampshire every single day. Yeah. Right? And, and so for us to be able to kind of think a different way, yeah, I would, I would just a couple to throw out there, you know, all just right. off the top of my head, having thought about that for a few days. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you your. Uh, I'm going to give you an, uh, an opportunity to give me an elevator speech, 30 seconds or less. Why should one of my young students choose health IT as a as a field when they graduate? Don't choose health IT when you graduate. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. No, I just said why? Because it is again the nexus of, and, and folks don't know. I'm looking right at you right now, brother. Right, it is the nexus of people problems that are just have to be solved the use of data pulling all those things together for something that 
for wisdom, to be able to grab knowledge and wisdom, for, for people to be able to make real decisions that are lasting. To me, what else do you want? I mean, that's health IT. Hell, that's why you want to be a professor, right? That's, right. that's why you are a professor. You and I have the same desire when it comes to those things. That's why we always got along, even though you were the, the grumpy economist. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was the happy policy guy that gave worse grades. So, <laughs> because we wanted, we want to be able to help. We want to be able to 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 know that it's about people solving problems. And help, where else in IT are you going to be able to get access to data to be able to call, solve those decisions for problems that are people are really, really trying to solve? So that's what I'm passionate about. That's why I would do it. Mark, it's been a lot of fun catching up with you as always. Thank you for taking the time. I know you got to get home to the family. That's what I was going to say. Best to you and the family. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, it just, it just means a lot to be able to hang out with you, my friend, anytime. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.